Hello, everybody. Well, welcome back to another episode, or welcome to maybe this is your first time joining us at the Art of Intervention Project Summit. But uh, today we get to talk a, about a couple things we haven't talked about yet in this in this journey of talking about addiction and recovery and transformation. So we have Dr. Mel Pohl on the interview with us today. And uh, so, Dr. Pohl, when you kind of talk about yourself, well, not, not, not you know, when you talk about yourself, but how do you describe yourself? So my favorite subject, talking about <laughs> uh, I am a family practitioner. Uh, I've been in the addiction field for about 40 years, uh, running treatment centers. And for the last 17, I've been uh, the medical director at the Las Vegas Recovery Center. Uh, for the past 10 years, we've treated co-occurring chronic pain and addiction, a uh, program that I got real interested in uh, because we'd see all these people with primarily opioid problems, but also alcohol problems, who were also experiencing pain, and they were actually on the meds because of the pain. And there, there was nothing for them. It was a very, very limited services. So we started this program. Uh, it's grown over the years, and we've treated hundreds of people who have both pain and dependence, typically on opioids, and uh, shown them a way to a better life. So uh, in the last Two years, I've been in the chief medical officer of the same program, Las Vegas Recovery Center. That's great. And thanks for stepping into that too, because I feel like you know people have genuine pain in their body, and given what they're prescribed to take, and then that dependence kind of happens. So, what's the journey like for people that innocently yeah. step into that area? And I'll say that about, I mean, innocence the wrong word, of course, because a lot of addicts are innocent too, and the in the journey they embark on, but but I know what you're saying, and inadvertently, you know, uh, through the back door, and the journey is a, it's a sad one. You know, uh, I, I go to the doctor because I have pain and I'm sick of being in pain, and the doctor sort of means well. We you know give give the doctor the benefit of the doubt. He or she prescribes some medication, and within a short period of time, it's going to be an opioid. Starts out small, you know, maybe Lortab five milligrams. 20 just to see how it works. Well, it works, you know, and it makes life better and the pain diminishes and I can sleep better and I can function and all is right with the world. But as we fast forward and follow the journey, what happens is the more I take, the more I need to take because I, my body develops tolerance to the drug. And uh, within a short period of time, maybe a month, maybe two months, I'm on double the dose or I'm on oxycodone instead of hydrocodone, which is the, the lower tab, or maybe the doctor's adding a long-acting drug to a short-acting drug like long-acting morphine or long-acting oxycontin to oxycodone. And my morphine equivalence, which is how we measure the potency of what I'm taking, goes up. And here's the real rub. My function, instead of getting better, is getting worse. My pain for a while got better, but because of physical dependence, which is an inevitable result of taking chronic opioids, in between doses, my pain goes up. So the net effect of being on opioids, and now we're talking about three, four, five, six months, years and years, is that the pain is higher on the opioid than off because I'm really in withdrawal between doses. Uh, and, and, and most importantly is that life shrinks in my my mood go, is depressed, my energy level is down, my motivation is down, my engagement with life is, is diminished. And you know, people get worse instead of better. Which is weird to think, right? They're going on this journey thinking they're gonna get better. And can you explain to people kind of how, how does the opioid work with the pain? What does it do inside the body that causes it you to not be in pain? Sure, so the, the pain is experienced. So just to briefly differentiate it, acute pain, broken leg, uh, infected tooth, you know, surgical incision, take opioids, take them for a short period of time and be done with them. But chronic pain is what we really are addressing here. And chronic pain, more than three to six months worth of pain, an inevitable, progressive, ongoing, really lifelong condition. Uh, and that pain, rather than being in the tissue, like the broken bone or the infected tooth, ends up being in the brain. So in the brain, in the middle part of the brain, we have receptor sites where the opioids work. They're called opiate receptors. 
and there's a variety of different uh, names for them. But basically, the opioid comes from the outside, gets into my system, goes to my brain, and then comes the connection between the opioid and the opioid receptor. And the result is that the pain goes away, anxiety goes away, I get a sense of, of well-being uh, oftentimes. So that's, the, that's the, the right use of an opioid for a short period of time. But over a long period of time, this marriage becomes dissonant, just like many marriages. And, you know, the drug isn't doing what it used to do because I'm tolerant. So I need more of it, more of it. And my, my body gets so used to it that I can't be without it. And it, even for hours at a time, let alone for days at a time, if I stop the drug, my pain shoots to the roof and I have opiate withdrawal, anxiety, sweats, nausea, vomiting, you know, the typical, it, it looks just like heroin withdrawal. Uh, and then there's one other factor to know about, which is really the most paradoxical about chronic pain, which is that if I take opioids on a long period of time, instead of having a pain reducing effect, the opioids cause inflammation in my brain. They wake the brain up in a certain way. It's almost like a defensive response to this foreigner, this foreign substance. And my brain makes activating neurotransmitters that cause more pain so that on the opioids, my pain level is here off the opioids. And, and I know this because we take people off their opioids. We detoxify them. And at the end of detoxification, within a week or two, their pain level has gone down. That's weird. That's just weird to hear you say that. <laughs> no, it's very, you know, there are some people, it's interesting. When I say it to, to most people, they say, you know, something that I can't repeat on the air, but it, it, it you know, it's a four letter word and it, it, it's not love. Yes. You know, they, they call me a liar and because it's counterintuitive, but every once in a while, somebody will say, you know, I, I feel like that. I mean, if I look back at a year ago, I'm worse. Most people don't see it because it's like, you know, putting a frog in boiling water. If you turn the heat up slowly, they, do, they don't perceive that, that something is wrong. They, they miss it unless somebody's telling them. But, but every once in a while, it's, it's really peculiar. People say, you know, I, I had this feeling. And, and those people tend to do very well because they're ready to come off the opioids. They're motivated to do so. It's not like, a, a, you know, they're not kicking and screaming through the process. It works both ways, whether they're kicking or screaming or, or willing, but people who really get it, who really understand that life is not so good on the opioids, but they need help coming off, do better than people who say, no, I can't live without the opioids. This is, this is making me better. And, and the, the last thing I'll say is that when, when I ask those people, wait a second, how, how many hours of the day are you out of bed? Well, you know, I get up in the morning and I'm up for an hour and I have coffee and my back hurts too much. So I go to bed and take a nap. You know, if I get my opioid in me, turns out they're in bed 20 out of 24 hours a day. They have no quality of life. They're, they're depressed. They're anxious. They're, they don't sleep well, but they sleep a lot. And I say to them, but I, I can take you off the opioid and you'll be better. And they say, oh, no, no, that can't be because I've tried to go without the opioid and after a day I'm miserable. And then I get the chance to explain that that's opioid withdrawal. That's not what life is gonna be like. And some people really, they resonate with that message. A lot of people are like, oh, I'm not an addict. I did, you know, this is not addiction. This is, I, took a, I take them as prescribed. I'm doing what the doctor told me to do. You know, how could I be an addict? Mm -hmm. And I've even heard people talk about that to take them as prescribed that they tend that they feel like they need to go through some kind of medical detox or detox to actually feel good coming off of them. How often do you see that? Frequently. And, and the truth is that if somebody is physically dependent on a substantial dose of opioids, they really need to go to a professional who understands how to do detox. It could be as an outpatient, but, but optimally they're in a center or a, a hospital if necessary, that really understands the physical dependence process, the withdrawal process. I mean, we have a, a protocol for withdrawal that involves a variety of medications. We use buprenorphine short-term or suboxone short-term to facilitate getting them off. But at the end of the period of time, could be seven to 10 days, they are opioid free. And as I mentioned, their pain tends to go down over the course of time and their life gets better. 
Yeah, oh, yeah. So it'd be great to have a, a better life. But I, is it scary or um, is there a medical concern for people to try to just come off of these cold turkey at their house by themselves because they don't feel like they need to go anywhere to get help? Yeah, that's a fair question. I always caution people not to do that. Uh, there's, you know, medically opioid withdrawal isn't associated with severe complications like alcohol withdrawal or Valium, benzo withdrawal, but there's potential complications with blood pressure elevation and heart rate elevation. And if you throw up or have diarrhea, you can get dehydrated or you can aspirate. So I'm, I'm a conservative physician. I really prefer that somebody be under the care of a doc to really monitor and manage the process. And for our cornucopia of substance people out there, how dangerous is it for people to drink alcohol while on opioids? Uh, yeah, it seems like a logical thing to do, you know, just to give the opioids a little boost. Uh, truthfully, it, it's very dangerous. So opioids, the, the potential side effects of opioids is respiratory depression. Anything that's taken in addition to the opioid that causes respiratory depression is gonna combine and actually accelerate the process. So benzodiazepines or Xanax or Valium or Klonopin or sleeping pills have a high risk, alcohol equally high because it does suppress respirations. Uh, so, you know, people, and we see people with a cornucopia on admission and, you know, a little stimulant to wake them up during the day for their ADHD diagnosis, you know, a little Adderall. Uh, those people are in potential risk of, of serious consequences and really need to be under medical supervision. That's great. Important for families to hear that too. If you have a loved one at home to just always take, always take the road of extra precaution than anything else. Yeah. And I, we, I don't know how much we're going to get to families, but I just want to mention that being a family member of somebody who's got pain and substance dependence is extraordinarily complex, more complex than straight addiction. We call it malignant codependence because after all he or she's in pain i have to you know they have to take their drug for the for the pain so how can they live without it and it becomes this just like in an addicted family but worse there's this uh, enmeshment of because it's a medical condition it really seems more legitimized and harder for the family member to really say no, this is something that's not functioning better in your life, and, I, and you need to do something about it. Okay, yeah, family systems is huge. That's a big part of what the Art of Intervention is about. So what advice would you give to family members that are struggling with that decision to, to not do this or to do that? Yeah, I think, you know, what I tell families all the time, when I, as I get to work with some in advance of an intervention or uh, it, once the patient is admitted, Tell the truth. You know, the, the, the biggest uh, tool that a family member has is the unvarnished truth with a touch of love. You know, so it's not you're an idiot uh, or you're an addict, but you are taking drugs. And since you're taking drugs, your function has diminished. You're not part of my life the way you used to be. I'm concerned about you because you stop breathing in the middle of the night when you take some sleeping pills along with your opioid you know, and on and on and on. So it's really about getting a, a straightforward, truthful message out, uh, but never a, never a beat up. You know, the, as you know, you know, addicts beat themselves up way better than anybody could. So uh, it's really about taking a breath, getting clear on what the message is. And then if a family member is able to set limits around behaviors and boundaries around, uh, I don't want to be a part of this process anymore. And I don't know why this keeps popping into my head, but I'm thinking like families and parties and people that have dependency and going to a friend's house and stealing their pills and those kind of things too. What sort of, uh, of criminal things can happen to people that are illegally giving or taking other people's prescriptions if caught? Well, it's, it's a felony to uh, you know, use somebody's drugs without a prescription. I mean, it, it doesn't seem to be so because, oh yeah, I'm just giving you one of my pain pills. But in, in actual fact, it is a felony. You know, in, in Vegas, uh, where I, I work, uh, the, the open houses are the day when all the addicts are out scanning the medicine cabinets in the first day of an open house. 
because people leave their pills in the medicine cabinet, don't lock them, and, and they're off uh, scoring their, their, their drugs. Again, most of the patients that we see in our pain recovery program in Las Vegas, they're not, they're not doing criminal behavior. They're going to the doctor, they're getting a prescription, they're taking it as prescribed. Maybe they take an extra one on a day when it's really bad. Maybe they're drinking some alcohol along with it, but they're, they, they present different than people who have addiction. Uh, and sometimes they're in groups side by side and you know, they, they look at the addicts and they say, wow, you know, that's really something. And the addict looks at the pain patient and say, oh my God, you're taking 10 times as many milligrams as I am. How, how can you survive? So, you know, we always find the differences rather than the similarities. And one of the skills of our staff is that we introduce the concept of, you know, identifying rather than differentiating. And there's a lot of similarities between somebody who has developed their dependence on drugs in a doctor's office to somebody who has developed their uh, intoxicating effect from, uh, you know, getting high. But, but I will say that the, the folks that we see with chronic pain have the pathological pursuit, not of reward. So they're not getting high in a classical sense. They're, they have a pathological pursuit of relief. They want to be out of pain. That's their motivation. And if we were to relieve their pain, they would have a different experience in life. Mm, very good. I didn't know we were going to get a real estate tip today. For the, good to know for people <laughs> throwing houses and all that stuff too. Um, all right. So we've talk, kind of talked about the problems. People are stuck there in this space. Now there's ways to get out of this. I know you, we talked a little bit about like kind of mindfulness and CBT, DBT, all this stuff to kind of help sort this out. Let's talk about what are the solutions? Well, so the process of chronic pain, as I understand it, and you look at the neurophysiology, is 20% in the tissue. So let's say it's a bulging disc, or let's say it's a chronic infl inflammation in the shoulder. And by the way, I'm pointing to both those places because that's where my chronic pain is. But though the, the tissue is about 20% of the overall experience of chronic pain. 80% is the thoughts and the emotions in my midbrain where the pain signal lodges that really tell me stories about the pain. My back is killing me. I can't get out of bed. You know, my feet are on fire. You know, all these cognitive distortions, we call them. So the cognitive behavioral interventions are really to work with somebody's tendency to make things worse, catastrophize, to make things bigger, and to really look at what, what the truth is. The truth is I have a strong sensation in my feet. It's tingling and numb and burning. And, you know, sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not there. That's really different than, you know, I want to cut my feet off. So the cognitive distortions are, are replete. You know, I, I would ask your audience how many times they've said about a painful condition, my blank is killing me. Well, obviously it's not where you wouldn't be here listening to this, to this interview. Uh, and my back feels like it's killing me sometimes, but it's really, I'm not, it's not life and death. So that's part of the cognitive restructuring that, that goes on in treatment. The, the second part of that triad is the emotional part. So my anxiety and my fear, my anger, uh, my frustration, my guilt, shame, you know, all the emotions that are very commonly associated with any addiction are really, they're, they're rampant in somebody who's got chronic pain, sense of, of, of low self-esteem, you know, I'm nothing uh, in the world, I'm impotent, I, I can't work, I can't function, you know, I'm a burden for people, I'm a victim. So all of that has to be dealt with. And actually dialectical behavioral therapy is one of the best techniques to reduce uh, dis distress. Uh, acceptance commitment therapy is finding value in life and then motivating and getting committed to, to participating in it. Um, Mindfulness practice has probably the best database, way more data that says mindfulness practice helps people with chronic pain than opioids. There's actually no data that says over the long haul, opioids are beneficial to people's lives. Mindfulness practice, on the other hand, helps people's experience of pain so that it's, yeah, I feel the pain, but it doesn't bother me as much. I'm not troubled by it. And we've got some pretty good substantial data that shows the part of the brain that is reinforced with mindfulness practice. And I'm talking about, you know, noticing the present moment, focusing on an object like the breath, meditation, if you call it that, uh, that whole 
behavioral process improves the brain structure where the pain is experienced. And, and we've got MRI scans that prove that. Mm -hmm. uh, some sort of spiritual connection, whether it's through mindfulness, whether it's through a power greater than yourself in the 12-step recovery system, which works really well for chronic pain, by the way, um, you know, whether it's a religious God, it, it, it matters less the vehicle, but, it, but the fact that spirituality, I think, begins with anything other than me. And like addiction, chronic pain is, is all consuming, you know, I'm, I, you know, my pain and it's not fair. And, and uh, you know, how can I survive this? So changing the focus of, of from me to us, and, and that happens in the group process in, in Las Vegas, you know, watching pain clients in group, hearing what other people say and, and, and really starting to link up just like they do in the 12 steps in the recovery process. Yeah. Well, that emotional drain too, of the body going on and, and trying to play the game of do this, don't that is, is insurmountable too of people dealing with this that people probably don't even realize. It's, there's a lot that's not realized. So the, you know, the most powerful group that I run in, in treatment is when I start to ask people about chronic pain, I'll write the words on the blackboard. The blackboard fills up with things that we've been talking about, anxiety and fear and uh, depression and uh, hopelessness and helplessness and shame and guilt. And, you know, on, honestly, the, the entire wall has a whiteboard that's full of words and they're really all not related to back or uh, sharp or dull or it, they're not related to the tissue experience, they're related to the brain experience. So most of the work that we do, most of the work for somebody with chronic pain is in their thoughts and feelings and, and spirituality, however that works. Mm, I felt tired just talking about that. <laughs> just, th just thinking about that too. And, and you hear a lot in our country too of, you know, we're in this opioid epidemic and all this kind of stuff too. How does that term resonate with you? Oh, I, you know, I, well, the the fallacy about the opioid epidemic is that it's an epi that it's the 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 thing because really what it is we have an endemic disease of addiction that underlies in, in our society at fairly high rates way more people are dying from alcohol complications than from opioids but we've got a blip on the curve that is opioids and there were a lot of deaths there were you know forty thousand plus deaths uh, in the last year from opioid overdose. Most of those are now illicit fentanyl that's being imported from China. Most of that either in a pill form that looks like a painkiller like Oxycontin or in a powder form that's mixed to heroin. Um, but people are dying from opioid overdose. Opioids are a serious problem, but we also now have a resurgence of a stimulant. Uh, you know, methamphetamine is coming back and, you know, alcohol has always been a problem. And, you know, in my state and, uh, in 12 or 14 states, marijuana is legal. So we're going to see a, an awful, I believe, uh, epidemic or a blip on the curve for marijuana and complications. So I think not to lessen the impact of opioids because they are su substantial, but to really acknowledge that opioids are a part of this overall addiction problem. Yeah, and just continuing to just pray that this whole thing starts to subside someday. But, you know, it, it's, it, who knows? But I know that you all are making a huge difference. And just want to have like one final question that might be um, to get people connecting with you a little bit. But why do you actually care? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've been doing this work, as I said, for about 12 years. That's when I got interested. And part of the reason was because of my own chronic pain and the futility of doing you know, my back is the biggest problem. So I went to a back doctor and I got injections and I got radio frequency ablations. And one doctor wanted to uh, fuse my spine. I see a lot of patients who's, who go down that road and it's a dead end. Uh, I didn't add opioids because I'm a man in long-term recovery. So they're, they were never an option, thankfully, because, you know, I, I could be vulnerable to being dependent on opiates like all these folks. I just think the medical profession has missed the boat. Uh, and I think patients have, have been so uh, under or mistreated. Uh, and it's not a, a punitive kind of an attitude. It's just, they're not getting what they need. They're, they're getting led into a direction of medicating or operating or 
you know, doing some medicalized procedure when actually this is a, a process that involves the mind and the spirit. And when we go away from treating somebody's mind and spirit, I think we leave the, the area of, of health. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting older and, uh, you know, this has become my life's work, teaching people about chronic pain, physicians and other colleagues and, and addiction professionals, and also working with patients directly. It's, it's the best thing I do. That's wonderful, too. And I want to direct people to, uh, I'm gonna, I totally should have had this out on my desk, but what is um, the book, the, one of the books that you wrote that's like, I don't know if you've written more than one, but like the most popular book out there on pain. What's it called? Uh, it's uh, Red and White. It's A Day Without Pain. A Day Without Pain. A Day Without Pain. I want, to, I want to encourage everyone watching this, if this is one of your things, to go out, find it on you know, Amazon, wherever they can find it, look it up and, and order that book, download the book, whatever you can do because there's so much great content in there. I remember when Jolene sent it to me and I was like, oh, it was, a, it was, it was great. So I know I have it on my bookshelf over here, but I'm sitting here right now. So thanks for sharing that too. Um, anything else you want to say to our listeners or families right now that might be in a space of not knowing what to do? I'd say uh, there's hope as there is for addiction with people with chronic pain. Um, and, you know, step back from what you see and, and see, the, see what you see. In other words, if you look through these kind of glasses at a medicalized condition of chronic pain, you'll only see that. If you look at your husband or your wife or yourself suffering from this overall condition, it can be way better than it is right now uh, if you take that into account. Thank you. A lot of hope in that statement right there. So uh, Dr. Melpole, thank you so much for joining us on the Art of Intervention Project and hope you have an amazing rest of your day. Thanks for the good work.